Representative Crockett, welcome back to the program. Basic question here. Is anything at all getting done in the House? No, absolutely not. Um, in fact, we are prevented from doing anything. That's committee hearings, that's markups, that's absolutely uh, putting bills on the floor until we have an elected speaker. The speaker pro tem, his only job is to oversee the speaker election. It's, it's, that's unbelievable to me that the House has been ground to a halt on this. L let me ask you this. Kevin McCarthy, of course, lost his job over the spending bill, the you know meeting in the middle with Democrats over uh, the spending bill there. But the spending bill was just kicked down the road. As you well know, it comes back up November the 17th, about 40 days or so from right now. It's uncertain who's going to run the House. Is Congress going to be able to keep the government open next time then when this comes back up next month? I, I don't know. Um, I, I was absolutely confident that we weren't going to be able to keep the government open this time because Kevin McCarthy failed to reach across the aisle. And right now the rhetoric has been, he agreed to work with Democrats. He did not. We got the bill 15 minutes before he wanted us to vote on it. We had to pull all types of maneuvers just to have an opportunity to try to review what was in this 71 page document. He never communicated with us. It's, it just so happens that it actually was a clean CR and Democrats voted in the best interest of our country, not trying to save McCarthy, not trying to give him a leg up. This was all about the people in this country. And honestly, whoever is going to be speaker, if they look to be successful, they should put forward policies that are going to focus on the people first. Republicans are, are even blaming some Democrats right now for not backing Kevin McCarthy as speaker. What's your reaction to that? <laughs> it's a joke. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he lost his job because he had members of his party that did like the fact that Democrats have been helping in a bipartisan way to pass legislation that benefits the country. It's an absolute joke. Listen, McCarthy caused this entire downfall of his legacy. Um, McCarthy is the one that said that it will only take one person to vacate my seat. He didn't have to do that. He's the one that agreed to that in the rules. In addition to that, um, we continuously see that the Republicans that have caused this disarray, this, this whatever faction you wanna call them, they honestly don't want to govern. And so the only way someone can be successful is if they actually pick up the phone and call Democrats. You know, the idea that we were supposed to save Kevin McCarthy and he didn't even pick up the phone and say, hey, can you save me? That's absolutely ludicrous. And honestly, when you have that kind of conversation, then it looks more like, all right, if you want us to save you, Kevin, we have to have an assurance say that we're gonna keep the government open, right? And, and we would have to be creative about it. And we would most likely need some rule changes, get some of these radicals off our rules committee. Like we need to get back to governing. We've not really governed at all. I mean, most people don't understand that we've had nine months to pass appropriations bills and we've not, we've not been governing at all. And it's time to get to work. People are relying on us. How often do you interact with Republicans on the on the Hill? And, and what has their reaction been since all this happened? Well, I don't interact with them very often. Uh, it's nothing like the Texas House. So in the Texas House, we all sit on the floor together. Um, in fact, uh, I know that there's been a lot of talk about the mayor. The mayor had a Republican desk mate. Like that happens all the time in the Texas House. Not so much in the U.S. House. Number one, we don't have desks. And number two, the whole idea uh, about reaching across the aisle or the left and the right, that's actually how we sit. Re Republicans sit on the right, Democrats sit on the left. That's in committee as well as on the floor. So we don't interact that much. Um, every once in a while, we'll see each other on flights like I, I did uh, on my flight yesterday. Uh, I did see one of my Republican colleagues that I know very well. Uh, and we talked about it just a little bit. And I said, what are y'all going to do? And his answer was, I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> so I think that, yeah, they needed to take this week, even though to the American people, it looks like a waste of time. And for everyone that's talking about government waste, I mean, I'm sure people are thinking this is terrible. 
But we saw what happened when we tried to get sworn in in January. We went 15 rounds back to back to back because we had to be sworn in before we could do anything. Well, they've decided they know that they don't want another display like that where it's just round after round. But I can't guarantee you the next week when we go back that we still won't have a replay of the same. Lawmakers are due back on Tuesday. What do you expect to actually happen on Tuesday or Wednesday or any time in the coming days? I, I don't have any expectations. <laughs> um, I, I I did receive a, a little bit of word. Uh, it looks like there's three contenders that people are actually supporting. Um, it's the same thing that I'm sure that y'all have been reporting. Uh, one of those contenders being the former president, which that's just not going to work because the rules say that he's not qualified. So thank goodness for that. It's amazing he's not qualified to be the number three in the U.S. House, but somehow he's qualified to be the number one. But that's a discussion for a whole other day. Um, <laughs> and and Steve Scalise, as well as Jim Jordan, I absolutely do not believe that Jim Jordan could coalesce and, and get the entirety of his caucus for sure. Um, and Steve Scalise may be a little bit closer to being able to do that, but I still think that he may may struggle. But I, I think Steve Scalise is probably in the best position. And honestly, neither one of these guys are, are good choices. You know, if the Republicans were really serious, they probably would take somebody who's in a Biden plus whatever seat, and they would actually make that person speaker. That is someone who has to navigate in a different way, cannot um, work on the extremes, and would be justified in going across the aisle. So Honestly, taking these people in these very gerrymandered, very red districts is probably going to produce the same result. What do you expect a new speaker is going to mean to any Democratic priorities? Nothing. Nothing. I, I anticipate that we'll get a lot of the same. I mean, it didn't really matter, honestly, which Republican was going to be speaker for us, because so long as they are going to allow the radical MAGA far right extreme faction to basically um, control the entirety of the caucus there. It, it doesn't matter who's in the seat, you know, until we get somebody, like I said, maybe one of those, I think there's maybe 17 Republicans that are in Biden districts. If we could get one of them, then maybe they would see the value in working across the aisle. But right now we have a Republican Party that can't do math. We have a Republican Party that does not understand that the Senate is controlled by Democrats, that we have a Democrat in the White House. That means two out of three are Democratic, which means that you will never get, you know, these spending bills passed and signed into law that are completely contradictory to what has already been agreed to when we shouldn't have been talking about the budget in the first place when we were dealing with the debt ceiling. Let me touch on that one more time. Next month, Congress has to decide again whether to keep the government open. There, there's no Speaker of the House now, no one to lead that process. W what do you expect to happen? W will the government shut down November 17th? I said the government was shut down before. I believe the government will shut down again. I still have my my buttons that say no government shutdown, no Republican government shutdown. I have not thrown those buttons away because I think that they are going to be necessary. We see that this radical faction wanted to fire their speaker because he kept the government open. And so long as the rules remain the same, he can do the exact same thing. That is not what Matt Gates and some of the others want to do. They truly want to tear us down from within. When people talk about enemies, this is an enemy from within. And until the Republicans decide that they're going to stand up and say, we are going to put country first, we are going to put the American citizens first. And if that means that we've got to work with Democrats, then we will do that. If they take an active, if they make an active decision to work with Democrats, guess what? Then maybe you can count on Democrats to save you. But so long as you want to go out and, um, you know, reimagine history, history that just occurred on Saturday and blame Democrats for bringing uh, us to the brink and acting as if Democrats didn't overwhelmingly keep this government open, unlike the Republicans, where over 90 of them voted against keeping the government open, then that's just not an honest broker and we can't deal. We just want somebody who's going to be honest. And I don't know if there's anyone that has um, honesty on their priority list in, in the Republican caucus right now. 
Do you see anyone on the Republican side that you could vote for for speaker? No. That I could vote for? No. No, no, no. Just, no. just making sure. Just making sure there. <laughs> you, you went viral about 10 days ago for slamming Republicans for not having any evidence in their impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. It struck a nerve with Republicans because everyone was talking about your impassioned speech there at the end in that committee hearing. What was the most surprising reaction you had? Um probably the death threats from MAGA about it. That probably was the most shocking. Um, shocking and then not shocking, right? Because um, that's what politics has grown into, unfortunately, under the MAGA regime. Um, the racist nonsense was, you know, it was expected from the party that proudly supports the Proud Boys. Um, but definitely kind of the death threats, um, mm -hmm. simply for doing my job and pointing out the obvious. And, you know, as the saying goes, only a hit dog will holler. So obviously I did strike a nerve by showing the American people what evidence really looks like versus being involved in a sham hearing where they literally did not bring one fact witness. Like, that's not our job. Our job is not, this is the majority party show. They could have brought anyone in. Or the fact that they refused to allow Rudy Giuliani to be subpoenaed. They don't want Rudy to testify. They don't want Rudy's um, right hand who also had information about Burisma. They had traveled and gathered this information and they had decided that there was nothing there. They didn't want them to testify because these are their guys that would say, listen, we have investigated this. There is nothing to see. So instead they brought people who could not offer any facts, but they simply are running a campaign. And when you start to govern, once you're elected, it is not about campaigning. It doesn't matter who calls my office. When they need help, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican or independent. If you live in my district, I help you. And so the fact that we have Republicans that refuse to govern but instead want to, you know, participate in the next campaign is is one of the things that's tearing apart our institution right now. Congresswoman Crockett, we appreciate the time. Thank you. Absolutely.